Like uniformitarianism, evolution by natural selection offers a completely naturalistic, that is, not requiring anything apart from the natural laws of the universe, explanation for the diversity of living forms and the way that organisms seem to be very well designed for what they do. The word design, however, is misleading because it suggests that some kind of intelligent force either guided or somehow caused the organisms to have their state of perfection or near perfection. Taken literally, this suggestion of an intelligence would call into play something beyond the natural universe, which would put this discussion outside of the domain of science. Remember that science's authority extends only to things that are subject to natural laws, that is, subject to mechanisms that are repeatable and supported by evidence from the real world. Evolution by natural selection is such an explanation. Creation, or design, is not. Biology is a science only to the extent that it is fully understandable within the envelope of the natural laws of the universe. And natural selection is the principal shaping force that makes apparent design possible in the complete absence of anything supernatural. If you hear a scientist referring to a particular feature of an organism as being designed for a given task, or even having a particular function, maybe someone might say that a fish's tail is designed to push water efficiently. What this is really is just a sloppy shortcut for a longer explanation that goes more like this. A fish's tail has been shaped by natural selection over thousands of generations in which fishes with tails less efficient at pushing water tended to be unsuccessful, thus leaving only those fishes with better tails to reproduce and pass the genes for efficient tail shapes onto their offspring. It's easy to see the appeal of using the sloppy shortcut. Another scientist might hear the first scientist say design and understand that what's really meant is the longer version. But in a biology class where it's important to communicate ideas with accuracy, using the sloppy shortcut as a means of simplifying the language to make things more accessible is really not a good idea. The word function is widely used by biologists to mean the highly desirable outcome resulting from the use of a given structure, as in the function of a fish's tail is to push water. One could argue, though, that this is also a loaded term in the sense that it could imply intended function, which again suggests that it was the goal of some type of shaping force, an implication that is fully misleading because of the way it suggests something about evolution that just isn't true. The use of the term function is extremely widespread in biology classes, and this is accepted only because the term itself, function, does not necessarily imply a deliberate intent. So when you hear in this class a discussion of the function of a particular biological structure, keep in mind that this is function in a sense lacking any kind of intent. A lesson in one of the con videos you watched was that evolution is not goal-directed. Every living species today is the end product of a long history of evolutionary change, but that history of change was never motivated to move in the specific path leading toward a modern organism's present state. This is a very important part of understanding the way that evolution by natural selection works. The sloppy shortcut of saying that something was designed for a particular reason or that it has a particular function does in fact suggest the very same goal directedness that both Kahn and I want to avoid in our representations of the evolutionary process. So this preamble actually sets up the main part of our discussion by giving us the mental picture that any one species at any given time is evolving in response to natural selection imposed by its environment. However, the direction of evolutionary change is not predetermined. To give you a concrete example, if the environment is becoming drier, a lizard might evolve by changing its diet to include foods with more water content, like fruit. Or it may evolve to spend more time underground. Now, The body form of a lizard adapted to living underground is not the same as one that's well suited for climbing in the trees, which might be needed for eating fruit. So the direction of evolution by natural selection 
could go in either direction. Now the direction is also dependent on the availability of the genes that would allow for evolutionary change. For example, if there are no genes available for making the lizard's legs better suited for climbing in trees, then for sure the lizard won't be evolving in that direction. New genes arise through rare mutations, and if the mutations that contribute to the variety of lizard genes happen to favor evolving to live underground, then there's a greater likelihood for lizards to evolve in that direction. Now the mutations might also favor tree adaptation, and you don't know this ahead of time because mutations are random. Along with natural selection, this kind of chance event also plays a role in determining the direction of evolutionary change. Now, think about what can happen if a population becomes split into two or more isolated subpopulations, and then these subpopulations remain separate from each other for thousands or even tens of thousands of generations. Maybe a mountain range forms in the middle of the area inhabited by the species, or maybe an ocean opens up because of continental drift, and the organisms on both sides live on perfectly well, though without any genetic exchange with the other side. A good example of this a classic example, is that of the snapping shrimp. Now if you think about where Central America is right now, you want to know that for a long period, stretching from just under 200 million years ago through about 3 million years ago, there was actually sea there. It was a Central American seaway that connected the Pacific Ocean with the Caribbean. With the closure of the Central American Isthmus 3 million years ago, Many shallow water marine species were divided into a Pacific population and a Caribbean population, and inshore burrowing shrimp would have been among them. For the past three million years, the Pacific and Caribbean shrimp has each had its own history independent of the other. Now, if evolution really did have a preordained direction in which it progressed, then both Pacific and Caribbean would evolve in concert toward the very same goal, and you'd find that the two shrimp today are very similar even after three million years. But of course, this isn't what happened. Natural selection operated differently on the two sides of the Central American Isthmus, and each side had a different history of random mutations. Basically, each population underwent its own evolutionary trajectory, and eventually they became distinct, to the point where now they can no longer interbreed even if you bring them back together into the same location. This is speciation, the formation of new species. Pacific and Caribbean shrimp used to be part of the same species or gene pool, but now they've become separate species. In other words, they're separate gene pools. Now in a nutshell, this is how new species form. Let's diagram this and call the original species A and the two distinct species you find after a long period of separation, B and C. Now think about what happens if each of the two new species continues to not only persist, but evolve and split and then split again, giving rise to lineages of organisms that are evolving and forming new species that themselves evolve and give rise to more new species. We can call the whole array of organisms descending from species B, lineage B. Meanwhile, on the other side, species C gives rise to a whole family of species in lineage C. All of these species in lineage B are more similar to each other than they are to any of the species in lineage C, because they all descend from species B. The organisms in lineage C do not descend from species B, and therefore, if there are any B-specific characteristics, you expect to find them in the organisms of lineage B, but not in lineage C. Likewise, the organisms down here in lineage C all trace their ancestry back to species C, but the organisms in lineage B do not. To the extent that B and C had evolved differences from each other at the time that they gave rise to their respective lineages, there are also going to be C-specific traits in the organisms of lineage C, traits that they inherited from their common ancestor, species C. 
The organisms in lineage B should not have these traits. They would not have inherited these traits from C because they do not descend from C. And they would not have inherited them from B because B did not have these traits. Too abstract? Let's try walking through this again with dogs and cats. If you go back far enough in time, roughly 42 million years, there were no dogs and there were no cats. But there was a species, call it a dog cat, that was the ancestor of all dogs and all cats that have ever existed. This dog cat is basically species A. And then speciation occurred and the dog cat gave rise to two new species, B and C. While they were probably very similar to each other when they first parted ways, over time, one of these eventually evolved to have cat-like traits, while the other evolved into a more doggish animal. Now, one of the animals along this lineage became the most recent common ancestor to all dogs. Wolves, coyotes, foxes, jackals, raccoon dogs of the Orient, extinct dire wolves, and, and many others. One of the animals along this lineage became the most recent common ancestor to all cats. Tigers, lions, jaguars, ocelots, pumas, cheetahs, and so on. Why are all cats similar? Well, it's because they descend from this common ancestor that had evolved to become distinctly cat-like, and its traits were inherited intact to most of its evolutionary descendants. An animal from this side, like a coyote, does not descend from this ancestral cat, and consequently, it would not have inherited those cat-like characteristics. Of course, a modern house cat is one of the species on this side of the tree, while a corgi is somewhere on the dog side. A house cat and a corgi are different species. True statement. And a house cat and a snow leopard are also different species. Another true statement. I hope most of you would agree with me that a house cat is more closely related to the snow leopard than it is to the corgi. What is the basis for making that statement? Is it based just on similarity? Because one could argue that from an ecological standpoint, the house cat's habitat and the corgi's habitat are more similar to each other than the house cat's habitat is to the snow leopards. Doesn't this mean that kitty and corgi share a more closer tie than the connection between kitty and snow leopard? Of course not. Everybody knows that a snow leopard is a cat and that a corgi is not a cat. Saying that the house cat and the snow leopard are cousins while the house cat and the corgi are not cousins is basically a shortcut way of saying that the snow leopard and the house cat share a more recent common ancestry through this specific ancestral cat species which is the most recent common ancestor shared by all cats. The house cat and the corgi also have common ancestry, though it's through our ancestor A, the one that we call the dog cat, which certainly existed, but it's far more ancient. It existed millions of years earlier than the cat ancestor that's shared by the house cat and the snow leopard. So generalizing here, the evolutionary relationship between two species is closer or more distant depending entirely on the recency of their common ancestry. The more ancient the common ancestor, the greater the distance between the species. Species that share a very recent common ancestor would not have much time to evolve great differences, and they would tend to be similar to each other in key ways, and consequently you would probably recognize them as being close evolutionary relatives. Okay, now we're going to look at other parts of this tree. The cats and their kin and the dogs and their kin are just a part of the evolutionary family of animals that's related through the same ancient dog-cat ancestor. Between the original dog-cat and the most recent common ancestor of dogs, there were other lineages that split off, giving rise to things like bears and seals and skunks and weasels. On this other side, between the ancient dog-cat ancestor and the relatively more recent common ancestor to all cats, there were other lineages splitting off, giving rise to things like civets and meerkats, and, oddly enough, hyenas. 
this whole group of all animals related because of their common descent from the same dog-cat ancestor from 42 million years ago is the subset of mammals classified within the order Carnivora. Take a few steps further back on the evolutionary family tree and you could place the Carnivora within a larger tree that descends from an even more ancient common ancestor from 65 million years ago. And this is a tree that includes all living and extinct placental mammals, that is, mammals with a long uterine gestation period, which is the vast majority of modern mammals, except for marsupials and monotremes. So not including wombats or platypuses, but yes, including everything else, from elephants to mice to humans to blue whales. Now, if you want to get to the common ancestor we share with wombats and platypuses, you'd have to go back to the common ancestor of all mammals that lived 225 million years ago. And then you'll have to go way back to around 350 million years ago to get to your most recent ancestor with a chicken. Birds, lizards, snakes, alligators, turtles, and all of the other non-bird dinosaurs are also descendants from this particular ancestor. This ancestral species from 350 million years ago was some sort of generic land-based vertebrate, existing at a time before there was a huge diversity of land-based vertebrates. It underwent speciation at species A, and the two lineages B and C that it gave rise to underwent different evolutionary trajectories, with one lineage ultimately giving rise to the mammalian ancestor, the one that existed 225 million years ago, and the other lineage gave rise to all the reptilian vertebrates as well as the birds. Every one of these splitting points is an ancestral species giving rise to two different species, an A giving rise to a B and a C, the same speciation story that we went through earlier. And the two lineages marching forward in time from the split are organisms evolving along their own paths that would eventually split again or terminate with the complete extinction of the lineage. Splitting or extinction are the only two options in evolution. As you continue to step back, you begin to get the picture that all of life is interrelated through common ancestry. You, a human, are more closely related to a bear than you are to a starfish. And that's because the most recent common ancestor that you share with the bear is more recent. It's that 65 million year ago common ancestor of placental mammals than the most recent common ancestor that you share with a starfish, which was a very generic animal that existed somewhere around 550 million years ago. In his book, The Ancestor's Tale, the biologist Richard Dawkins expresses this idea in terms of generations of separation from the point at which your nth degree great-grandparent was the same as the bear or the starfish. In Dawkins' calculation, you and the bear share about a 25 millionth great-grandparent. Well, you need to go back another 250 million generations to get to the 275 millionth great-grandparent that you share with a starfish. As Dawkins puts it, all of life is a continuum. There is a direct pattern of common ancestry that connects you with every single life form that has ever existed on the planet. You continue stepping back from the human starfish common ancestor and you eventually get to the common ancestor that you share with a worm. Go back even farther and you get to the ancestor that you share with a mushroom, which is an organism that lived more recently in time than the most recent common ancestor that you share with a petunia. There's an enormous tree of life that depicts the phylogenetic relationships between organisms. We base our system of taxonomic classification on the ideal of having taxa reflect the phylogeny. But I'm starting to use two terms here, phylogeny and taxonomy, that are focal for this lecture. And so we should be clear about the meanings of these concepts and the distinction between the two. When I refer to a specific organism, I mean as a representative of its species. Cat, corgi, person, petunia, 
Each species is the latest rendition of a successful lineage after a long history of splits and evolutionary change in this enormous, enormous family tree. It's phylogenetic history. Phylogeny means literally origin of phyla, but I don't recommend that students use this as a definition because in biology, the term phylum has a very specific meaning. Well, here we use phyla in a much more generic sense of the groupings of organisms that are united by a most recent common ancestor. So when we say phylogeny, what we're referring to is the history through which organisms emerge as related to each other through a common ancestor. This is the history that says definitively that there's a greater distance between you and a worm compared with a relatively smaller phylogenetic distance between you and a squirrel. An equivalent way of saying exactly the same thing is that the most recent common ancestor that you share with a worm is more ancient, while the most recent common ancestor that you share with a squirrel is more recent. Taxonomy refers to the way we classify things. In the context of Bio 110, we're classifying living things into groupings, or taxa, based on similarity. As such, we're putting some order to the living world. Similar species are classified together into the same genus. Similar genera are classified into the same taxonomic family. Similar families are classified into the same taxonomic order. As we move up through the named ranks of taxonomic classification, we go to larger and more inclusive groupings. Beyond order, there's class, phylum, and kingdom. Your textbook covers the general rank-based taxonomy, and there's little need for me to belabor that discussion. The point that I want to emphasize here is that in order for taxonomy to be a science, it must reflect phylogeny. The criterion by which we justify organisms as similar should be based on shared ancestry through a single most recent common ancestor. There's a group of closely related dog species that are classified within the genus Canis, and this includes the domestic dog, Canis familiaris, the wolf, Canis lupus, coyote, Canis latrans, golden jackal, Canis aureus, as well as a few others. And these dogs are related to each other through a relatively recent common ancestor. And this would be the genus Canis common ancestor that they do not share with more distant related dogs and foxes, foxes, raccoon dogs, which are classified into different genera. By the way, genus being a Latin word is made plural with a Latin plural, genera. Species, another Latin word, is the same spelling both in singular and plural. All of the genera of distantly related dogs, jackals, and foxes, and raccoon dogs make up the family Canidae, all related to each other through their most recent common ancestor, the family Canidae common ancestor, which is more ancient compared to the most recent common ancestor shared by the members of the genus Canis. Dogs in the family Canidae cats in the family Felidae, bears in the family Ursidae, seals in the family Phocidae, all of the organisms descending from that dog-head ancestry spoke of earlier are classified in the taxonomic order Carnivora. At this point we should probably redub our dog-cat as the Carnivora order ancestor. The Carnivora, together with other taxonomic orders of mammals, such as the rodents where the mice are, Primates, where the humans are, Cedardiodactyls, where the whales are, Proboscidea, where the elephants are, as well as many others, are related through an even more ancient common ancestor, the placental common ancestor of 65 million years ago. And when we go way back to find that ancestor we share with platypuses and wombats 225 million years ago, that is the ancestor of the taxonomic class Mammalia. Anytime we refer to a group by its taxonomic name, like the Mammalia, or the Rodentia, or the Ursidae, or the genus Canis, class, order, family, and genus respectively, what we really mean is all organisms united by a most recent common ancestor. 
Being descended from the Ursidae common ancestor means that you are part of the bear family. You might also notice that there's a hierarchy to the system of naming taxa. Mammalia, carnivora, canidae, canis are all at different ranks in this hierarchy. Canidae is one of many families in the order carnivora. It is nested within the carnivora. Carnivora is one of many orders within the mammalia. It is nested within the mammalia. Mammalia is one of several classes nested within the phylum Chordata. The Chordata is nested as one of several phyla in the kingdom Animalia. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species are taxonomic ranks, that is, levels in the taxonomic scheme. Again, the bottom line in this lesson is that our taxonomic system of classifying things into groupings within groupings within even larger groupings is intended to reflect the evolutionary history of the organisms, their phylogeny, such that all the organisms classified within any given taxon are different from all other living organisms in being descended from a single species, their most recent common ancestor, that is not an ancestor to any organism outside of the taxon. As you move backwards in time toward the base of the evolutionary tree, you discover more ancient ancestors shared by larger arrays of organisms that have fewer similarities. And these ancestors are ones that define taxonomic categories of higher rank. Your most recent common ancestor with a monkey, the order primates common ancestor, is more recent than your common ancestor with a wombat, the class mammalia common ancestor. You also have greater similarities with a monkey than you do with a wombat. Phylogeny, concerning evolutionary relationships among organisms, and taxonomy, the classification of organisms, are different things, but they go hand in hand. Moreover, a system of taxonomy that's connected with phylogeny is a science in a way that other kinds of taxonomy are not science. It's worthwhile to point out here that the naming and classification of living organisms began with Aristotle and carried on to the time of Linnaeus, whom we call the father of taxonomy, all predating Darwin. My point is that you can, and we did, classify life perfectly well without any underlying science. There's no requirement that taxonomy have anything to do with phylogeny. This is just the rule that we impose so that taxonomy is reflective of the natural order of life, which has been shaped and diversified through the basic mechanisms of evolutionary change.